Hello Gems, Leah from Red Emerald Yoga. Welcome back to my channel for today's unboxing video. Today we're going to be unboxing the Bohemian Animal Tarot, written by Scott Alexander King and illustrated by Sharon McLeod. Okay, so this is a rock pool deck. And this is another one of those decks that I've had for a while. I've just been waiting for the right time to open it. So let's get this opened. I purchased this deck after, what was it? Shoot, I don't even remember what it was. But there was a deck I came across and it kind of reminded me like Puss in Boots. <laughs> and I really wanted a deck, like a, I would love a Puss in Boots deck um, if the whole theme was that. But this was the closest thing that I found. And so I was like, you know what? I'm totally getting it. This is an older deck. I don't know when this was published. Um, it doesn't have it written on the back. So maybe it'll tell me on the inside in the book. So I'm going to read the back. It says, The Bohemian Animal Tarot, a unique tarot set featuring 80 cards and a comprehensive guidebook. The Bohemian Animal Tarot offers a totally unique tarot experience, representing our archetypal aspects as part human and part animal. It explores the fundamental types of people and life situations entrenched in the collective psyche of all people. The humanistic qualities of the major arcana may also symbolically represent our emotional and spiritual development from the newborn infant to adult, while the animalistic side could be said to mirror our inherent primordial strengths and weaknesses. Blending 15th century Tudor and Elizabethan inspired costume styles with a classical late Baroque, Victorian, and French theme, and a touch of the Romani Gypsy, the Bohemian Animal Tarot is a tarot set that has never been seen before. Scott Alexander King is a shaman, visionary, and zoomancer, Australia's best known and most respected expert on animal totems and symbology, and the author of several best-selling titles, including Animal Dreaming, Animal Dreaming Oracle Cards, Earth Mother Dreaming, and World Animal Dreaming Cards. He has a website, which is www.animaldreaming.com. Sharon McLeod is an artist deeply inspired by nature, the goddess in her many forms, and the existence of fairies. Sharon's great-grandmother taught her many of the old ways of the Anglo-Saxon gypsy. She is famous for her illustrations in Witchcraft Magazine and Europe's Fay Magazine. Okay, so let's get this open. I don't know if you can hear that. It sounds like my neighbors are doing some deep cleaning <laughs> so we may get some cleaning noises okay so it's got like a lovely shiny burgundy inside it's like um i don't know if it's it looks a little different on camera but in person this looks like a very um brick red okay so we have a nice really good size book let's see so it looks like it's in black and white, and this is first published in 2014. So I think this is 2014. I believe it's the first printing. Okay, so it goes into the preface, acknowledgments, Introduction, Animal Symbolism, Bohemia, the Majors, and then I do like how it tells you what the animal is. That's something I always get curious. Like, I always want to know, <laughs> what's the animal? <laughs> so I can kind of relate, you know, sometimes um, I I'm not an animal expert, so I, I'm like, oh, is it this animal or this animal? So I like that they explain it. Um, it says the miners Okay, so it goes into the elements. Air. It says wands. 
ruled by the element fire, swords. Okay, so they're switching this up. Normally I associate fire with wands and air with swords, but this one's gonna be a little bit different. Ruled by the element water, cups, and ruled by the element earth, pentacles. Okay, so their reasoning are, wands are the suit of creativity, action, and movement, governing qualities such as enthusiasm, adventure, and risk-taking. So they're saying that that is air for their deck. And for fire, swords are the suit governing the intellect, thought, and reason, concerned with justice, truth, and ethical principles. So not going to lie, that will trip me up more than likely um, quite a few times. And when I'm working with this deck, I'll probably have to just like do a refresher. Like, wait, let me see um, which suit is which. <laughs> okay, so they talk a little bit more about air. earth, water, fire. So the associations, like as far as the um, the cardinal directions, I do associate air with the east. Okay, the mind, it says yellow and adolescence. Okay, earth is north, which that's my same um, association. The body, the color white and childhood. Okay. Water, west, that's the same as what I am used to. It says uh, water is the spirit, blue or black, and elderhood. Fire is in the south, which is what I'm used to. It says it's associated with the heart, the color red, and adulthood. Hmm. And then, um, so that's the northern hemisphere. It says in the southern, the wheel turns anti-clockwise with the elemental correspondence changing accordingly. So let's see, um, air east, the mind, yellow. Oh, so they have yellow or orange if you're in the southern hemisphere and they associate that with childhood. Fire is adolescent. So those switch, wow. Okay, so that's probably something to go through and just like really sit with it. So it has a three card spread, the Celtic cross. So it just comes with two spreads and then it goes straight into the majors. It's a black and white book. So this would probably be one that I would still sit with and have my actual deck of cards with me and go through um, the guidebook in that way. It's not something that I have to do. It's just something that I enjoy doing. It's part of my bonding process. And I just wanna see if there's anything in the back. No, okay, it just talks about um, Scott and Sharon. Ooh, it's gilded. Okay, there's a, it's a little bit scuffed and lifted here. This is a really old deck. Um, I mean, I do have older decks, but still. And they are, um, they are sticking like in chunks because of the gilding. I don't know if you can see that, but there's like distinct chunks. I will not keep the deck in this box. I might just keep it um, in my box of boxes. This is glued in there. And yeah, I do have a velvet bag. I'll just keep it in, a, in the velvet bag. So let's open this up and see how damaged this gilding is. Oh yeah, this is really stuck together like one solid brick. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's there. So I'm going to break the binding. Oh my goodness, it's a very stuck. Oh, this is so scary. It's so stiff. Holy cannoli, this is wild. Oh my goodness. Like if somebody broke in my house right now, I would literally attack them with this deck of cards. It's 
solid. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna edit this out. I might leave it in just so you can see what you potentially would be getting yourself into. Oh my goodness, if you buy this deck. <laughs> you might wanna get this one used. Oh my gosh. It's so like this side seems like it's starting to break free, but over here it's it's still really stuck. Terrifying and gratifying all at the same time. <laughs> kind of like going to a chiropractor. Okay, so well, I got them separated in piles. It's Wow. I'm afraid to just like separate them because sometimes you can chip the gilding right off the card. So I'm trying to just like pry it free. I can feel like right here, this is just like all stuck together. I don't know if I have these completely loosened up. Um, we'll see, but it's not as bad and scary as it would be if I was going through and doing it in the old way that I used to do it. I guess we'll check out the cutting after we get them all separated. But this is going to be a square-ish, like a roundish corner. It's not completely round. And you could feel the gilding lifting, or not the gilding, the um, face of the card kind of curves up a little bit on this front side. If you can feel it lifting just a little bit. And that looks like it's on all the cards. Yeah, so that might be a little bit rough in the hands. Okay, so let's take a look at these cards. And I have already mixed them up um, on accident. <laughs> so we'll go through them and see if we can get these back in order. Let me get my book so I can see what these animals are. Okay, so the goddess, card three, that's a bee. Okay, she's a bee. Okay, and then the god is a stag. Very handsome fellow. The shaman, that's a heron. Oh, these are stuck together. Okay, so the shaman is a heron. He's very cute. And the lovers, these are pheasants. I like their tails. 
Now that I know what they are, <laughs> I might have thought that was a snake at first. Like, what is going on? <laughs> but now that I know that those are pheasants, okay, those, that's a pheasant's tail. Card seven, the carousel, obviously, horses. This little guy's cracking me up. Card eight, the warrior. He's a badger. Card nine, solitary. Looks like a bear. Yep, bear. The Wheel of Fate. We have little pigs. Card 11. This is a spider. Ooh, look at her spider legs coming out behind her. Card 12. The Suspended Man is a bat. I like that because that's sleep upside down. It's a very fancy looking bat. Death is the vulture. Card 14, moderation. I don't know how you pronounce that. Ermine, Ermini, Ermini. Card 15, the lower world is a toad. This is stuck together too. And 16, the Rook, it's a raven. The star is a unicorn. The moon is a wolf, I like that. The sun, lioness. And a jackal for judgment. We have all kinds of stuff in there though. We got mermaids, looks like a fairy. Is that a phoenix? I don't know. Fox, cat, with angel wings, and all kinds of stuff. Okay, I'm hoping they explain that in the book. In a lot of the cards, there's extra things, it seems like. So we have 21. The Earth Mother is a turtle. And then we go into our extra cards. The universe is an ibis. And the afterlife is a mandrill. Ooh, he's so handsome. Look at his face. The artwork is really interesting on these cards. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can find um, The missing cards. Oh, here we go. Okay. So card two, we have the high priestess, a hair. I got mixed up when I was trying to um, separate the cards. Very interesting looking high priestess. 
and then the high priest. It's a fox. Love that card. And the innocent. The coyote. He's cute too. Okay, so we have all of our majors. Those are all here. Let's check out our minors. Okay. So it starts with air. These are mixed up too. Okay, so we have the ace, which is Oh, okay, here we go. The ace of air, which is a crow. Love it. I love my crow friends. Two of air. Wolverine. Wait, that's eight. <laughs> They're not in order. <laughs> okay, that was just a test to see if you're paying attention. Oh, where is it? Oh my goodness. Okay, well, whatever. We're just going to try to get them in order. Okay, so the eight is a albatross. An albatross. The five of air is a hen. That is so cute. And the four of air is a lynx. The king, oh, here it is. The king is an eagle. That makes sense. The knight is a hawk. I saw two hawks on my walk yesterday. That was really cool. They were messing around in a tree, making a bunch of noise. Nine of air, a gecko. <laughs> He's totally stressed out, but I don't know. This card makes me laugh. He's funny looking. And we have the page. The page of air is the magpie. And the queen is owl. Seven is the Wren. This is not going to be something that I actually memorize um, more than likely. I'm, I'm not going to remember that, but um, if it comes up in a particular reading, I might look it up like, oh, you know, you have this animal in this position, you know, could indicate this, but it's not something that I would do for every card. Six is the Cat. Ten. Oh my goodness, the goat. So ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Oh, and then they're stuck together. Three and two. Three is a rat. And two is a wolverine. I would not have guessed that was a wolverine. I guess it's from Hollywood, <laughs> those, those um, action movies. <laughs> I picture a Wolverine looking different. <laughs> but that is a Wolverine, <laughs> two of air. Okay, so we have all of our air cards. Then next we have, let's see, fire. So the Ace of Fire, we have our Cobra. That one's pretty easy to recognize. 
And again, out of order. I'm not sure. I think I did that though when I was separating them. Eight of Fire is um, Antelope. The five, those look like ostriches, my little pop quiz. I'm all excited because I got it right. <laughs> five of Fire. Let me just show you this one up close once I get it separated. Their costumes are hilarious, especially this one. I really like this one. Oh, are these raccoons? Four, four, yes, four are raccoon. And the king of fire, oh my goodness. Who are you? Salamander. Oh, duh, there's like salamanders on the robe. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> And then the knight is a goose. We were just talking about that the other day. We were walking by these houses and there's just these big wide open lots. And it was, um, there's like a trail where a lot of people walk. And we were talking about how we wouldn't really be comfortable living in one of those houses unless um, my husband was like, oh, if we had like these types of dogs. And I was like, yeah, those types of dogs and turkeys and geese <laughs> and wiener dogs too, because... <laughs> They would really <laughs> stop people in their tracks. <laughs> the turkeys and the geese wouldn't mess around. <laughs> so I love that they have um, the night of fire as a goose. Because I definitely associate geese with being brave and, and fearless. I don't know if you've ever seen a geese chase people down at the park. Or those ponds, you know, and, and they just, they're fearless. <laughs> and people go running. <laughs> they're getting chased and they're honking. They're like, ah! <laughs> Anyways, that's off topic. <laughs> Nine of fire is an ant. Oops, I'm pumping my tripod. Okay, page of fire is a meerkat. Very cute. Oh my goodness. And look at the queen as a dragon. I love it. Dragon is way cool. And then the seven, here we have a boar. <laughs> I really like the suit of um, the suit of fire. These these animals are great. Six of fire, the lion. Ten of fire is the elephant. I love it. And the little keyword on that is commitment. I have not been reading those, but. Three of fire is the kangaroo. That keyword is emergence. That's really cute. And the two of fire is the tiger. Very cool. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I just want to make sure that all of these are here because that has happened in the past where I was missing a card. Okay, let's see. Next is water. And then with older decks like this, it kind of makes it a little bit scary because it's like, oh, are they going to have it? This deck is still available for purchase. It's not completely sold out, but still, it just makes me a little nervous cutting it close. <laughs> okay, so Ace of Water. What? Oh, I was looking at the mermaid like that doesn't look like a black jaguar to me, but it's hiding in the back. It was blending in. <laughs> okay. And this is just part of the cup. Interesting. Okay. And then we move into the eight of water contentment, which is bluebird. Very pretty. I just saw a bluebird on my walk yesterday too. I feel like all of these animals were calling out to me yesterday. <laughs> Maybe they knew like, hey, open this deck. We want to communicate with you. Five of water, the weasel. That reminds me of a person we know. <laughs> we call him the weasel. <laughs> Four of water. Oh, look at the little koala. Oh. The king of water, frog. I love his little toes. He's got like yogi toes. He's grabbing, <laughs> latching on. <laughs> He's like, Rrr. the knight of water, 
the pelican. Gorgeous. We were watching pelicans surfing the other day, not on a surfboard, they were just riding the waves. They were having a blast. It was high tide and it was like a massive shore break. Those pelicans, they were showing people how it was done. Card nine, the elk. Oh, I love it. Very handsome. And the page of water. I love it. Is that a dolphin sitting on a lotus flower? Yes, it is. Super cute. Love him. Oh, and the queen. The little seal. So cute. Seven of water. We have the dragonfly. And the six of water, I think those are beavers. Let me see. Oh, otters, they're otters. They have a different face. Yeah, they're otters, cute. I would have liked to actually see them in the water, um, but that's still really cute. The 10 of water, <laughs> turkey. Again, I was just talking about the turkey. <laughs> turkey is a guard animal. <laughs> Three of water, mongoose. I used to live on this ranch and there was a, um, a pair of turkeys and those turkeys would hunt you down and they would chase you and peck your shin, <laughs> or not your shin, your calf, the back of your leg until you dropped your snack or whatever you were eating. You would drop it and take off running for your life and then the turkeys would go and eat it. <laughs> Those turkeys were mean. <laughs> oh my gosh. Two of water, doves. Very cute. <laughs> okay, so let's make sure they're here. Four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and our four court cards. Yes, they are. Okay. Moving on to what is this earth? Okay. <clears throat> so, five of earth. We have the armadillo. Four of Earth. We have the rabbit. Oh, look at that king. Oh, he is absolutely stunning. What is he? Emu. I love him. Look at his little feet. <laughs> so cute. The Knight of Earth. Is that a rooster? Yep, the rooster. The Nine of Earth, Squirrel. Page of Earth, I love it. The Dog, stands for loyalty. I'm definitely a dog person. Queen of Earth, Mountain Lion, ooh. Gorgeous. And then we have seven cute little mouse. And the six is a ram. <laughs> Five, four, okay, nine. The 10 is the white buffalo. Oh, that is awesome. Look at that. Three of earth, Robin Redbreast. I thought it was called a red-breasted Robin, but <clears throat> I've been wrong before. I will definitely be wrong again in the future. Two of earth, butterfly. It's 
kind of a creepy looking butterfly if you ask me, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Ace of Earth is the bull. And the eight is, what are you? The beaver. Oh, they did have a beaver. I'm glad they have a beaver. Okay. I really wanted there to be a beaver. All right. One. Oh, oh, there it is. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And the four court cards. Awesome. Okay. So they are all here. So I do like that the animals are included. I do like that they right off the bat gives you like little keywords that are associated with that animal or that card. Like some of them, like I just automatically associate those with that animal, like joy, otter, um, stamina and elk. Thanks for a turkey. Yeah, like Thanksgiving, I guess. Um, Liberation, a dove, spirituality, black jaguar, collection, squirrel, tradition, white buffalo, growth, rabbit, like really expanding. Um, and also I liked how like the, um, where is it? The rabbit, the four of, what is it? Four of earth. Like how it literally looked like it was making something out of nothing. Like it's popping it out of a hat. So I thought that that was an interesting take on it too. That's kind of cool. So it'll be interesting to see how the um, illustrations come into play. So I said that we would look at the cutting once we got them all separated. Now that they're all separated, they do lay a lot flatter and smoother than they did. But I mean, this gilding is um, not going to stay perfect. This is going to be one that definitely gets worn and weathered and there is some edge lifting already um right out of the box here this card is pretty bad wait is it two no it's one so the gilding is separating from the um from the card and it's lifting the lamination a little bit There was like something stuck on there. It's probably from the other card because they were really stuck together. Yeah, I think if I just had decided, um, I'm not going to, but if I was going to keep, try to keep my cards in this box, I think that they would just continually get worse and worse because this thing right here, this is an old box but um, it's not smooth. I don't know if you can see that. Like this thing lifts. So like every time you take your cards in and out of this box, that would just continue to scuff up those already really rough, um, those really rough edges. So yeah, that's just like, it really grabs right there. So if you get this, just be careful when you're taking it out of the box and do not store your cards in here. If you wanted to, you could even do a bag, rip this thing out and, um, throw your bag in here if you wanted to keep it in the box but I'm just going to keep this in my box of boxes and keep this in a velvet bag okay so let me start going over my list I think the packaging is pretty rough but again it's an old it's an older deck and I don't think Rockpool still uses these kinds of boxes um, mostly I've been getting Oracle decks from Rockpool and they come in like a different packaging but I, I, so I, I really don't know. I don't know if they still use this, but I would be really hesitant to want to purchase a deck in this type of packaging. And if I was a deck creator, I would not want my deck to be shipped out in this kind of a box. Um, the functionality, I, I think it's a big box and it's a waste because I won't keep it in there. Let's see, description, organizations, and the spreads. Okay, so let's just pick a random card and see how it reads. So here we have consequences, card 11. So let's see how this reads. This is gonna be a major arcana. 
So we've got the little image here. And it does give you quite a bit. So we got these two pages here. So it says the animal archetype, according to Native American folklore, it was Grandmother Spider who sang the universe into being by weaving the first dream catcher or web of destiny. Every night the spider weaves her web and every morning she pulls it apart, fully prepared to reweave it later that night. Her web is symbolic of life with each of us representing its vital strands. We are all imbued with strength and wisdom capable of enhancing the planet and spider encourages us to explore life with some paths offering reward and others not. As we journey the positive strands of her web, life seems abundant. A wrong turn, though, may deliver challenge, punishment, or nothing at all. Life may become difficult, with all attempts to free ourselves proving futile. The web of destiny is riddled with pitfalls. It also promises justice for those prepared to make amends, play fair, and work hard. The card description. Card number 11, Consequence, depicts a fly a creature long associated with demons and plague in countless early manuscripts as a vehicle of death, decay, and destruction, according to Hebrew belief, and an envoy of evil, sin, and pestilence in the Christian faith. Receiving a tarot reading from a gypsy woman spider, the weaver of the web of destiny, the eight legs, and eight eyes of the spider remind us of the card's eighth card placement in the original numbered sequence of the earliest tarot. A set of scales hang balanced directly over the plainly dressed Amish fly's head, suspended from the hilt of the Sword of Justice. Pointed upright as his reading reveals the death card, and storm clouds loom overhead, obscuring a clear blue sky. So I can't really make out the card, but in the book, like they do a really good job describing what's happening in the card. So that's pretty cool. The scales represent differing points of view or both sides of a story and a possible outcome that balances on a choice being made. While the sword signifies a conclusion or a decision with little or no chance of another outcome being offered. Two key principles exercised by the Amish are their denunciation of pride, overconfidence, and conceit, and the high value they place on modesty, serenity, self-control, and placidity, or submission, displaying an unwillingness to appear brazen or assertive. The fly, therefore, seems content to submit to the fair will of Jesus, meaning he won't react if he is knocked down again, or argue if he is punished. The Innocent's Quest. The innocent finds himself faced with yet another challenge to know without question what his life truly means to him. Facing his future, he ponders his past and the consequences his actions and the events of his life have caused and how they have all helped to bring him to this leg of his journey. The innocent must make some tough decisions and important choices. He will remain true to himself and the promises he's made, or will he revert back to his old ways? He decides he must be held accountable for his past deeds, with a vow to put things right so that his future may be paved with truth and honor, realizing that the course of justice must be upheld if he sincerely plans to start afresh. The key words for this card are justice, accountability, choices, cause, and consequence. The divinatory meaning for this card, it says, what goes around comes around. Justice, fairness, impartiality, righteousness, even-handedness, fair dealing, honesty, integrity, acting ethically, legal matters, court, judgment, decisions, equality, endeavoring to do what is right, taking responsibility, tying up loose ends, setting old accounts. They have a lot of keywords here. Finalizing old debts, truthfulness. Admission of guilt, handling the situation honorably, doing what needs to be done, decisions pending, decisions made, weighing everything up, hearing all sides of an argument, setting a new course of action, balance, correct behavior, having full awareness, being aware of the full story, cause and effect, 
accepting the consequences of your behavior, choices, the actioning of karma, owning your involvement in a chain of events, divine balance, universal peace, order, the quest for truth, doing what is right, receiving your dues, the impact of a past mistake, being haunted by a past mistake, apology, putting things right, making amends, reward for a good deed. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Again, I like how it explains like everything that's happening in the image, um, what the artist's inspiration was. So this would be like the justice card. So if you're not familiar with your rider weight, this might be confusing. Plus then they added an additional two cards, which you could choose to read with or not. Again, not all of them are renamed, but you do have quite a few name swaps. So that can be confusing. And then you have the renamed suits, water, and then you have the swap of the element associations, which vary from the writer weight. So that can also be confusing if you're a new reader. Let's pick a random card um, from the minor arcana. So we're going to do the two of fire. Let me find that. Well, whatever. Let's just, we'll do seven, seven of water. Because I think that'll be faster to find then. And then looking for a specific card. Okay, so seven of water. Keywords, illusion, pipe dreams, choice, opportunity, indulgence. So here we have a little dragonfly and then another dragonfly. And they're checking out all of these things. So they're pretty similar to the Rider weight as far as like what's in the cups, only this one's a dragonfly. It says the dragonfly, a symbol of rebirth, deposits her eggs in the water where they hatch into ferocious aquatic larvae before transmuting into adult dragonflies. The dragonfly emerges from a totally aquatic lifestyle to become a creature capable of full aerial flight. After transmuting, the dragonfly is no longer restricted to the confines of the pond in which it was born. As children, we are taught values and beliefs that are based on cultural or family tradition and morals that may be regarded as outdated in today's society. These beliefs seem so real that we accept them as our reality. As we mature, these ways often contradict our self-discovered principles, and we learn to adapt them accordingly. Depending on how deeply these beliefs were ingrained, though, sometimes we cannot shake them in order to make way for our own. When this happens, we find ourselves in turmoil because we feel we are dishonoring our culture, our family, by trying to follow our own truth. The dragonfly encourages us to break through self-created limitations that hinder our development and growth. It asks us to acknowledge the beliefs we may have woven around ourselves as a form of protection, and to check if they were put in place to prevent us seeing a truth, or to stop others seeing who and what we really are. The dragonfly asks if we started to believe our own deception, because if we have, our view of the world may be restricted by a tainted perception of what is real and what is not. As a result, the view the rest of the world has of us may be unfairly tainted also. Oh my gosh. So for the minors, there's actually more writing than there was for the majors. I was really surprised about that. Okay. Our description, the seven of water, depicts a dragonfly with her back to us, her arms outstretched in surprise as she tries to take in and comprehend seven mysterious cups, symbols of the water element, that have materialized in front of her. Each cup is laden with a strange and mystifying gift, and the dragonfly is confused and overwhelmed by their ghostly appearance. The cups sit atop a cloud, a symbol usually associated with thoughts, dreams, feelings, fantasy, change, or evolution, and the unknown. The seven apparitions offer an assortment of both positives and negatives, each containing a single gift that rises from the depths of the cups, offering the dragonfly choice and opportunity. Some offer gifts of wonder and opportunity, while others offer danger or lessons that may harm anyone silly enough to take hold of them. A golden serpent, representing knowledge, experience, and understanding. A veiled human form, representing the desire for clarification. A dragonfly representing a friend or a partner for the dragonfly. 
a castle representing permanence, security, and authority. Jewels representing affluence and capital. A bunch of grapes representing bounty, triumph, respect, and social standing. And mask flames representing mystery and paranormal or otherworldly influence. The dragonfly must decide what of the many tempting choices she is being offered is the best one, or whether or not they represent real or tangible opportunities, or if they're just illusions suggested by the dragonfly that hovers nearby. Symptoms of pure fantasy or the result of an overactive imagination. The numbered cards, the sevens, while the fives were about insecurity and the sixes were about regaining a sense of balance, the sevens are about uniqueness and inventiveness. They offer challenges that naturally come with life that we often need to endure on our own so that we can learn to trust ourselves and mature as individuals. Inspired by the carousel, card seven, the sevens demand that we take responsibility when faced with difficult situations, that we take control and do what we can to endure and achieve. While the carousel is moving, the monkey riders sit unwavering upon their steeds back. And like the monkeys, the sevens encourage us to remain inwardly committed to our quest, to demonstrate our learned skills, successfully handle the unforeseen, and move forward in an inventive and unique manner. So I do like that they put that bit of numerology in there. That's pretty cool. Talks about how they relate to each other from the different suits. I like that. Divinatory meaning, delusion, fantasy, pipe dream, idealism, wishful thinking, dreaming, living in an illusion, feeding a wild imagination, ignoring the facts, Believing in castles in the clouds, waiting for your luck to change, waiting for opportunity to come knocking on your door, not believing in your own ideas, lacking faith in your own ideas. Options, having options, many choices, many alternatives, knowing you have endless possibilities, unlimited potential, having a blank canvas offered to you, unhindered possibility, knowing you can choose, being offered the pick of the litter, debauchery, falling into the trap of self-indulgence, overindulging, giving up, turning your back on responsibility, letting yourself go, being jumbled or confused, disorganization, overeating and drinking, immoderation, ignoring your health, addiction, laziness, inactivity, bad habits, negative patterns, procrastination, slackness, senselessness, negligence, looking at how disorganized you have become, a release of creativity, bringing dreams to fruition, making your wishes come true, backing up plans with hard work, tightening up your life, getting organized, neatness, order, routine, feeling proud of yourself, commitment, and tidiness. <laughs> okay, so that is a long description. I do think that the guidebook is good to go through with the card, but on your own time. I mean, this is not something that you would pull out, you know, and, and read to a client in the middle of a reading. I think you would want to have your writer weight meanings down before picking up this deck. I don't think that this would be something that I would recommend for a first, second, or even third deck. I think I would recommend branching out into something that sticks to the Rider weight a little bit closer before reaching for this deck. Okay, so I was going to talk about the guidebook cover art, which is nice. It matches the art on the box, which I thought was cute. I do like that card. I think it's adorable. Let's give this book a sniff test. It just smells like paper. It's pretty old, though, so... What was it? Yeah, 2014. So it's had 10 years to air out. So it just smells like paper. It doesn't really smell like anything. And the cards, let's give these a sniff test. There's no smell in the cards. It just smells like, it smells less than the book. The font size and the readability on the cards, it's really easy to see. In the guidebook, I think it's a good size. I like that. The picture is a little is a little muted. It's just a small shrunken black and white. I don't think that's a big deal. Whatever. You can see the image and then you can always refer back to your card. So I think that's fine. My 
favorite card. Let's see what is gonna be my favorite. One thing I do want to point out is that I do like that the art looks like it's hand it's hand done. I really like that, especially in this age of AI art and overly photoshopped decks. I, I do like this that it just looks real and it's there there are some imperfections and it looks like it was done by a human. I like it. So one thing we'll have to decide is like, am I gonna bring in their interpretations of the suits or am I gonna use my own? Because here it says eight of fire and there's wands, but I'm pretty sure it said fire was sword. Let me see, am I inventing things? So here it says air is wands. Okay. But here air is, clearly swords and the fire is wands, fire wands. So I think they just made a mistake with these two suits here and I think they just transposed those. So I, I don't think that that's, um, the guidebook is correct. I think the cards are correct. So I think that's just a typo. I think those are just mixed up and it was overlooked um, in editing. So that's a big relief to me. Now I won't have to memorize the whole nother suit association. That was one thing that I was like, kind of like, oh, how, how is that going to come into play? Um, but I'm happy that that was just a typo. Okay. So my non-favorites is still bigger than my still bigger than my favorites, but I do have a lot. I do have a lot of favorites. Let's start eliminating. So do I think these cards have a cohesive theme? Um, I do. They're animals that are dressed up in clothes and they kind of look old timey to me. They don't really look like they're from one specific era, but to me, I'm just like, it's just animals in clothes. <laughs> Okay, so they won't all fit in one, but let's see, who can we eliminate?
Oh, I just noticed the little leprechauns. <laughs> are they gnomes? What are they? They're gnomes. They're gnomes. They're not leprechauns. They're gnomes. I do like this card. Hmm. These toes crack me up. I love the toes. They're so funny and adorable. I like all the little fish, the hem of his gown, little trident. Like, I love all of it. There's so many little details. Every time I look at these cards, I see something new in there. Like right here, I just noticed the horses in the background, the white and the black horse. It reminds me of like the yin and the yang energy, and he has, has to balance those while he's taking this meditative time out. That's really cool. <laughs> so adorable, but it's not going to be my favorite. Trying to bring them a little bit closer to me so I can see. Kind of getting a glare, like over here. I really like this card. Instead of the Hierophant, we have the Shaman. That is awesome. I don't know. I don't know if I could take that one out. I think I'm going to take out Ace of Earth and the Page of Water, even though I do love these cards. I don't think they're going to be my favorite. Okay, let's see. See between these two, which one's going to come out, Death or the High Priestess? I have to say, Temperance doesn't normally um, 
it's not like a card that I really get excited about. But I love this temperance card. It's moderation, but we have like the little devil and the angel. Like, which voice are you going to listen to? It's just like a party. That's pretty cool. Okay, these are my final three. Um, I'm thinking the high priestess might have to come out because I think it's going to be I think it's going to be down to moderation and the shaman. But I think I'm going to go with the shaman for my favorite card. So let's get the guidebook and see what it has to say for my favorite card. The animal archetype, patient and ever watchful. The heron symbolizes the teacher who waits patiently for potential students to appear and for the correct questions to be asked. The heron is the wise one, mentor and elder, the one who provides guidance and helps others with their spiritual and emotional problems. Heron advocates being open to opportunity and willing to learn life's lessons. It suggests we find a level of stillness within ourselves to nurture it so that we can remain perceptive to the plethora of belief systems that are bound to be present as we grow and develop. With outstretched wings, Heron welcomes us and grooms us for learning. It humbly heralds the appearance of a teacher while declaring us ready to be offered sacred knowledge. Put simply, Heron teaches us how to access and interpret life's esoteric knowledge and its associated mysteries, as well as the best ways to integrate this knowledge meaningfully into our lives. Card 5. The Shaman depicts a blue heron dressed in an orange hooded robe, a color that suggests the realization of personal power and positive change and wearing a pendant of the Eye of Horus around his neck. His left hand offers a gesture of blessings, his two upraised fingers identifying the dual nature of God, who is both divine and human, or the unity of the God and the Goddess, while his three curved fingers have come to represent the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when in earlier times they may have embodied the maiden, mother, and crown. And I love how that's up here in the little brick. They're probably going to talk about that, though. Let's see. The heron is seen smudging a small gray tabby cat who sits cross-legged on a pile of cushions. The heron shows no fear, even though he is a bird and she is a cat. While tempering her natural instincts with his wisdom, he uses the smoke of burning sage that billows from a wall-mounted sensor and a white feather of confirmation, integrity, and purity. The smoke moves around the cat as the heron's prayers for her are carried out into the universe. The shaman is housed simply in a stone hut perched high in the mountains, its interior walls engraved with sacred spiritual symbols from assorted cultures. A mantis offers her prayers too, to the god and goddess, while a pair of regular blue herons fly past the open window. Where is it? Um... A mantis. Okay, where's the mantis? It's glaring for me. Okay, there it is. Okay, I like that. Both the herons in flight and the elevated position of the shaman's hut signify his advanced spiritual understanding and position of authority, which allow him to look down and see things from a perspective usually reserved for the creator. The Innocent's Quest. As the Innocent sets forth on his adventure, leaving home for the first time. He finds himself introduced to the beliefs and traditions of his culture and the organized ways in which his people have been taught to perceive the world. In short, by leaving home, he begins his formal education, probably under the watchful eye of a teacher qualified in esoteric knowledge and mystery. An individual of high spiritual or religious standing who offers the innocent initiation into a guild or a society. The innocent enjoys being trained and feeling like he belongs to something bigger than himself. Learning the customs and practices and demonstrating his commitment to a new way of life. Keywords are learning, belief systems, initiation, and belonging. And then it has divinatory meaning, which are also a string of keywords. Wow, there's a lot. 
being taught something new, learning, education, gaining knowledge, information, getting informed, getting an education, becoming qualified, study, and increasing your level of understanding, deeper meaning, deeper understanding, developing a belief system, aligning yourself with a religious or spiritual view, sharing a culture, engaging in ritual and ceremony, disciplining yourself to a way of life, faith, belief, conforming to an organized belief system, following set rules, following a conventional or orthodox way of life, tradition, conforming to the system, becoming part of something, fitting in, feelings of belonging, doing what others expect you to do, being programmed, brainwashing, becoming part of the system or establishment, becoming part of a group, commitment to a cause, devotion of energy, tithing, joining a group, working as part of a team, loyalty to a group, institutionalization, living with others, being part of a culture, official learning, learning in a group, interpretation of sacred or secret knowledge, taking up an appointed role, joining a school, club, team, company, or other society, joining a structured group that has rules, assigned roles and belief systems, group identity, fixed situations, trying to deal with a force that is not inventive, free-spirited, or individual in nature, choosing between following a program or tradition or trusting your own judgment. Okay, that's a lot of keywords, but I do like it. I mean, it gives you a really good overview of the card. And my favorite part of it, um, aside from the art, is that the book covers pretty much everything that is shown in the artwork. And that's just something I just get really nosy about. Like, what was the artist thinking? <laughs> what is being shown here? What is happening? I just enjoy it like a story. The art quality is anything blurry or muted or is everything clear? I think some parts of the card are a little bit dark. Um, for the most part, they do have good contrast, but there are a couple of cards when it kind of blends in. Again, it does look like it's handmade. It looks like it was done with like probably colored pencils. I do, I do like the art. I like that it looks handmade. I like that it's not perfect. Some are a little bit more like fine lined detail than others, but I, I like it. I do feel like it has a cohesive theme and I am happy with the art quality, the art style versus the Rider weight. It does, the interpretations follow the Rider weight, but again, there may be some confusion with the card titles. There's extra cards and then calling the suits by the element name instead of cups, swords, wands, pentacles. Does it remind me of a deck that I have? No, it doesn't remind me of a deck that I have. Is it for newbies? I don't think it's for newbies. I think this would be for, like for at least an intermediate reader. Who might like it? Who might not like it? I think people who want an animal deck, um, some something like where there's no people being depicted. I think if you wanted um, this hand, like I don't even know how to describe it, like handmade, like you could tell it was done by a human hand, the art quality like that, you might like it. If you like animals and clothes, like if you like Puss in Boots <laughs> type stuff, um, you might like this deck. If you're looking for something that incorporates different cultures and backgrounds, um, then you might enjoy this deck. If you're looking for a deck where it explains everything in the guidebook, like as far as the artist's inspiration, what's going on in the picture, um, all of that good stuff, then you might enjoy this deck and this book. Who might not like it? I know the 10 of, um, what is it? 10 of air had a lot of blood. It's like the 10 of swords. If you like nudity, if you don't want nudity, you know, then this may not be the deck for you. So I, I know there's one, maybe two or three cards where it shows out. Um, that might be a, I don't know. I don't think that's too risky, but some people might not like that. Um, Yeah, some people are just like very sensitive and um, they just like don't want to see animals being hurt. I can have this in my tarot cards, um, but there's like some movies I just won't watch. Like I won't, I don't want to watch a movie where the dog dies, you know, like I just don't want to, but I'll be totally fine watching a Lifetime movie with like a psycho stalker. <laughs> like, 
like, okay, it's just a person. <laughs> okay, here it is. Yeah, so that might bother, that might bother people. So just like know what you're getting into, you know? Um, is that everything on my list? Oh, no, it's not. How does it shuffle? Let's see how this deck shuffles and how it feels in the hands. Because I did say that it was lifting a little bit. And sometimes when the cards lift, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. Also, who might not like it is if you um, if you want the backs of your cards to not show which way is upright and which way is in the reverse, this is going to bug the crap out of you. Okay, because it's just like blatantly <laughs> animals in the reverse. Um, I think if like one animal was up, one animal was down, it wouldn't have been so noticeable. This does not bother me, okay? But I know that it really irks some people. So you'll definitely be able to see which way is up and which way is down. So right out of the box, it does shuffle nicely. Um, the cards are not grippy now that they've been unstuck. That was a terrifying process, by the way. They do glide. Let's see, just give it a couple more shuffles. Oh, <laughs> I had a feeling I was gonna lose that one. <laughs> Okay, let's see how they shuffle overhand. Yeah, they don't really grip at all. That's nice. I was kind of expecting them to grip because they have this like gloss coating on them. And sometimes that can get sticky until it breaks in. But these, I think these shuffle pretty well considering they just came out of the box. And also um, it's not uncomfortable, but it's not comfortable, if that makes sense. I would say, it doesn't really bother me, but you can feel it a little bit, that lift. The lift in the cards, like when I'm doing that, I can feel it. I wonder if I shuffle it the other way, if it won't do that. I wonder if it's more comfortable. I never thought of that before. Let's see. No, that's more uncomfortable than the other way. Yeah. So this way does feel more, more comfortable in the hands if you're going to shuffle them like this yeah with the back facing you feels more comfortable it's minor like I have a couple of decks that have more of a lift and those decks are really uncomfortable um like that will actually make me not reach for the deck or if I do reach for it I'll only use it once in a reading for that day and then I'll put it away like okay I used it um I got my fix and then I don't want to I don't want to use it anymore for that day just because it's it's very uncomfortable in the hands but this one I don't think I'll have that issue. I could see myself doing a few readings with this deck in a day. Sample reading. Okay, so let's do a sample reading for, let's see, what is today? Today's the 15th. We've got St. Patrick's Day coming around the corner. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> St. Patrick's Day and we got moderation jumping out. Do not overindulge. <laughs> Go easy on the drinking. <laughs> Let's see what else wants to come out for us for a little St. Patrick's Day advice. Ace of Air. Use good judgment. Let's see what this says about Ace of Air and moderation. Intellect, strength of mind, truth, integrity, justice, resilience. As a creature of the void, as indicated by its black feathers, the crow exists in the past, present, and future simultaneously embodying darkness within light and light within darkness, making little distinction between right and wrong while acknowledging the existence of both. 
Crow encourages us to seek the wisdom found in the silence and to ponder our actions and reactions to life. The deliverer of universal law, Crow often heralds a sudden but necessary change, a wake-up call, or a lesson in self-discovery. It espouses the law of three, that whatever we do will be returned to us threefold. For it matters not what we do in this life so long as our actions bring harm to none depicts a crow dressed in yellow robes, symbolic of the element air. The direction east and the rising sun, his left palm is held upward above, which a sword hovers. The sword, also a traditional symbol of the element air, is a honed weapon that can cut through pretty much anything, including obstacles, doubt, or confusion, offering clarity, peace of mind, and a sense of justice. The sword extends the mental power of the seeker so that he or she may rise above and succeed. Whether it delivers a cruel blow or a clean cut, the sword is a symbol of truth and honor. Here it is shown suspended midair by the crow's strength of mind while a regular crow sits balanced on the blade's tip. A second crow takes to the air in flight, enjoying the vast blue sky, while a small fairy, an elemental spirit of the air, alights on the crow's shoulder to remind him of its untapped potential and the magic that surrounds him at this time. Hmm. I think this card is suggesting to keep a clear and level head this St. Patrick's Day, Um, but also if should an opportunity present itself to you, you know, that this is a time of untapped potential and magic um, to really reach out and and grab that. And I think that's why you have to be clear-headed, level-headed, not overindulging. I don't know if that's something that you normally do on St. Patrick's Day or not, but I think this would be a call to perhaps be the designated driver or Show a little bit of abstinence. That is an interesting reading. I'm going to go to the book and show you card 14, um, just so you can see how that reads. But yeah, that was not that was not what I was expecting to come up at all. Card 14. Moderation. The animal archetype. Again, I don't know how to pronounce this. Um, Ermines. Hermione's and weasels are one and the same. I'm just going to call it a weasel. (laughs) During the winter, the weasel's coat turns from its familiar brown color to white. The only part that remains unchanged is the black tip of its tail. Is that showing? Oh yeah, there it is. The little black tip. That's cute. Royal garments have for centuries been decorated with Hermione pelts complete with their distinct black tip tails. Leonardo da Vinci's painting, Lady with the Hermione, Armine, I don't know how to pronounce that, depicts the teenage Cecilia Gallerani, mistress of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, holding what appears to be an oversized Hermione. According to legend, Hermione's will die of shame if their white coats become dirty. As such, since the birth of Christ, Hermione's have been revered as symbols of chastity and virginity, an ironic association considering women of this time were expected to remain chaste and simultaneously be willing and devoted mistresses. The Hermione portrait, a painting of Queen Elizabeth I by Nicholas Hillard in 1585, depicts the lady with an Hermione on her arm. Around the same time, a spotted Hermione-like animal appeared in the lady with the unicorn tapestry, entitled Sight circa 1500 France, while a woodcut published by Antoine Verdard, circa 1500 Paris, clearly depicts Eve in the Garden of Eden with a weasel at her toe. During the Middle Ages, female weasels were believed to conceive via their mouth and give birth via their ear, (laughs) an animal thought to remain forever in its virginal state, okay? It's obvious why Queen Elizabeth, not to mention Eve, was portrayed holding one, despite the fact that the Hermione and Queen Elizabeth's portrait was most like a Jeanette and not an Hermione at all. Its presence symbolically confirmed for the people her virginity, purity, and unsullied character. 
It has a card description. Card number 13. What? Moderation. So it's actually 14. There's actually quite a few typos in this book that I'm noticing. Um, moderation depicts a winged angel burlesque dancing. Ermine named Erminitrude, meaning maiden. Her outstretched arms support a green tree snake representing Archangel Raphael as it writhes from her left arm to her right, symbolic of the resistance of temptation and the shedding of old ways to embrace a life of balance and good. She makes her way down a small flight of stairs, an offering of choice, ascend into a higher state of being, or descend into immorality. She chooses to remain somewhere between the two. At her feet stand the devil and an angel, embodying the true nature of temperance one of the four cardinal virtues offsetting the negative with the positive, reminiscent of the traditional diluting wine with water. In addition to its literal meaning of moderation, the card also symbolizes the blending of opposites. Burlesque from the Italian burla and burlesco, meaning a funny story. Mockery or contempt was performed in a literary, dramatic, or musical fashion to cause laughter by taking a serious topic and making fun of its subject. Burlesque was intentionally ridiculous, and during the 16th century, the term referred to the gross over-dramatization of the nobility and the wretched alike. As such, the Hermione stance is one of balance and the synthesis of opposites. She reminds us to never take anything too seriously, to know when to have faith and when to laugh and walk away. She knows, for example, that she can be sensual and aware of her sexuality, without tempting fate or losing her dignity. All choices must be tempered delicately for fear of them going pear-shaped, like dancing with a snake. She needs to be careful and handle it respectfully or it will bite her. Behind the Ermini, Ermini are seated two female figures wearing skimpy clothes and cat ear headbands, suggesting the enjoyment of physical pleasure and indulgence without the guilt, shame, or repellent labels that often come with them. Around her neck, she wears a symbol of feminine sexuality and fertility, the Venus of Willendorf, the original of which dates back to 24,000 to 22,000 BC, and a collar adorned with a red rose, itself a symbol of the Virgin Mary, love, passion, courtship, and the human soul. To the left stands a large jeweled Fabergé egg, a symbol of luxury and indulgence, adorned with a sunflower, signifying rebirth, the Egyptian Ankh representing the concept of eternal life, and suspended between what looks like the golden horns of the mother goddess Hathor. Oh yeah, I see that. Fabergé eggs always contained a surprise. Perhaps the surprise hidden in the egg is the realization that you don't have to give up all the good things in life in your bid to be a good or spiritual person. All things in moderation are good for you, and if you live a life of temperance, your life will surely be long and abundant. The Innocence Quest The Innocence Life has been a veritable roller coaster ride until now, with many ups and equally many downs. He has reached a point where he needs to embrace moderation and find stability and balance. In the process, he receives the gift of symmetry. After living a life of excessiveness, he finds moderation and stability and composure. He has indeed come a long way in the realization of his harmonious life and is now a balanced individual who is both happy and healthy. Okay, so I do like that explanation. This reading does fit for St. Patrick's Day. I don't know what your plans are, but, you know, it's saying it's okay to have a little fun. Just do it in moderation. Keep a clear level head. You may need it. Yeah, don't let yourself be taken advantage of and don't take advantage of others. So I do like that. Very cool. So that concludes this review. I can't wait to dive into this guidebook. Um, I don't think I'll be doing it all in one sitting. That's a lot um, to really just take in and digest, but... I think doing it in small chunks, it'll be pretty fun. I do believe that I could read with this deck and just bring in my own interpretations of the Rider weight. But connecting with the guidebook is still something that I think I'll find enjoyable. 
I do wish that the card wasn't um, lifting on the edge, but again, it looks like it's like as far as like the lifting, the separation of the card, it does look like it's only one. And it's one of those extra cards, the afterlife. So we'll see. Yeah. So thank you for still here, for still hanging out with me. Thank you for sticking it through. I know this was a long review, but I don't like to skimp on anything. I like to go through my whole little list. Um, there are times when I forget stuff and then I feel bad about it. <laughs> so I think I got everything on the list. Thank you for hanging out with me and I will see you guys soon. Bye for now, Gems.